Good morning, Jubilee. I am excited to be here. My name is Justin Menzies, and this is my first official Sunday as the new pastor of Jubilee Christian Center. And I am very humbled and honored uh, to be here. And so you're going to be seeing a lot more of me, and I'm excited to just take this position. I've, I've learned so much this week. I have an amazing team here. This is truly a, an incredible house with uh, amazing people, and I'm just, I'm, I'm excited, to be honest. I'm really excited to be here. So uh, you're going to be seeing a lot more of me, and I'm looking forward to that, and I hope, I hope you are too. But but um, I just wanted to welcome you this morning. If, uh, if you want to give this morning, you can uh, text any amount to 84321, or you can send an e-transfer to darlene at jubileecalgary.com, or you can also go on our website and, and give through that as well. And more importantly, if you need prayer for anything, you can also uh, send an email to prayer at jubileecalgary.com. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to stand with you in faith. We'd love to believe with you. We'd love to fight the good fight of faith with you and know that you are absolutely not alone and we as the family of God are advancing his kingdom together and so we would love to hear from you any needs any requests anything that you just want to even talk through or pray through please reach out and I would love to get back to you so I hope you enjoy this morning and it's just an absolute blessing to have you with us Thank you for joining us. Let's just stand and let's just give the Lord some praise this morning. Thank you, Lord God. Father, we love you. Oh God, we worship you. You are the mighty King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are our counselor and our guide. Oh God, you are so good. You're our safe place. Father, you're our tower. You're our strength. Come on, church. Father, we lift our hearts up to you this morning. Oh, you are so worthy. You are worthy, King of Kings. You are worthy, you are worthy. You are everything I need, Jesus. You're my safe place, Lord.
Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. So this morning, uh, I want to go over a, a topic with you that is incredibly important to something that I would like to call family necessities. Family necessities. And what do I mean by that? I mean that in the family of God and in our, in our specific house of Jubilee, broader, of course, in the kingdom of God, in, in a kingdom family, but in Jubilee, this is one of the family necessities that I believe we need to see and to have in order to uh, operate in a healthy community and healthy family. And so I'm going to be talking to you today about this. Forgiveness, reconciliation, and offense. <laughs> How do we navigate these things? How do we walk in relationship with one another in such a way that if this were to take place, if you're getting shot in the back by somebody you know and your back is full of arrows, you can actually go and still embrace that person, not lose sight of their value and not lose sight of your value in that whole process. We can absolutely do that as the family of God. And so I just wanted to share this picture because like the saying goes, a picture expresses more than a thousand words could. And so this is a beautiful representation of what I'm going to be speaking into this morning. So forgiveness and reconciliation is something that I'm going to be very honest with you. I have, and I'm not talking specifically in Jubilee. Um, I haven't been in this position for very long, so I can't really speak to that. But in a broader stroke, I have seen that uh, a lot of believers really struggle when it comes to going a little bit deeper relationally with one another. And they struggle even more if there tends to be a little bit of offense or uh, a little bit of um, unforgiveness that begins to fester in a heart. And when left unchecked, I have, seen, I have seen many believers way too easily, in my opinion, cut off relationship with one another because of something that's happened to them or something they've gone through or something they misunderstood or, or however that played out relationally. I've seen people kind of throw in the towel on, on relationship within the family of God uh, way too quickly. And so I just want to talk about this from, uh, from a biblical perspective and from uh, a perspective of, if I could be honest, just a perspective that Jesus brings to us, not only in his life lived out, but also in his heart revealed uh, through, through the word. And so uh, offense is something that, you know, I kind of like the word offense because it, it, the word has literally has fence, the word fence in the word offense. And it's kind of a good, a good word to use to describe what's actually taking place because when we get offense with one another, it's actually like we're taking a fence and we're placing it up and we're putting this wall in a way between us and that person. We're cutting them off. We're closing up our hearts and they're no longer allowed on my side of the fence because I'm, offen I'm offended with them and I have this offense that's risen up in my heart. And so how do we navigate through these things? Because offense is real. We, it's not as if it's not going to come. It is going to come. But how we choose to go through offense and how we choose to go through forgiveness is something that is is not only incredibly important to God himself, but also very crucial for us to walk in healthy family relationships within the church and outside of the church. But again, if we can't figure out how to do it in a healthy way within the church, we're certainly not going to be able to do it outside of the church. And so I, I want to uh, just encourage you guys today that there is um, a, a really simple way to tell how you're responding to something that maybe it's been bothering you, or maybe you're angry about, maybe you, you're offended with. There's a, there's a really simple way to tell where that is coming from. And this is where it gets a little bit black and white for me. So when we look at this, there's, when we look at our reaction to something, there is two places we'll see our hearts go. One is either to accusation or the other one is to intercession. Those are often the two different places that we are prone to go. One is of the flesh and from the enemy, and the other one is from the spirit and, and is of Christ. There's the accuser of the brethren, which is the enemy, who lives to make accusation against us, and he'll try to do it through us to one another. And there's the great high priest and intercessor, which is Jesus Christ himself, who lives to make intercession for us. And so... 
in this, we see that we can actually judge our own heart in knowing where we're coming from. So when we get offended or hurt by something, are we being brought into a place of being enticed in our flesh and we're, we're coming in accusation? Well, I can't believe they did that. Well, you should know better than that. Well, how come you did this? And man, you just get frustrated and angry and there's this, this accusation that comes out and you're just, ah, oh, well, they, they should know better than that. Or you know the language that we use. But there's this accusatory tone that comes with it and it's usually harsh and it's and you're and you're angry and there's this anger now the uh, the anger is not something that is wrong in and of itself but what we do with that anger is where the issue can come in like Jesus says be angry but do not sin in your anger so we have to be careful though that we're not coming into a place of agreement with the accuser of the brethren as we're going through different difficulties relationally together now there's the second one which is Jesus who lives to make intercession and so if our hearts are, we, we come into a, an issue or a situation and all of a sudden our immediate heart, heart reaction is to go to the Lord with that. Father, I just pray that you, would, that you would come and bring reconciliation into this relationship. Lord, if they're not seeing clear, I pray that you would help them see clear. If there's something I'm not seeing clear, Father, I pray you'd help me see clear. But Lord, would I just bring this relationship to you and I pray that you would breathe on it and cause us to come through, to come through this in a way that will be even closer on the other side. There's this place of intercession that you come from. And so it's actually quite, uh, easy to see where our hearts are if we just break it down into those two very simple ways. Is it accusation or is it intercession? It's something that I think we need to get better at in the body of Christ. And so, uh, you know, I, I remember um, going through some stuff with forgiveness and, uh, you know, just really battling when I went through some personal things. And uh, we have a story, me and my wife, um, there was a community that we were a part of many, many years ago. And some stuff happened in the community and we kind of got blacklisted. And we, we, like all of our friends were part of this community and we got accused of doing some things that we never actually did. And we, we got kicked out of the community. And one of my uh, one of my really really good friends that I had been friends with for a long long time, also uh, ended up just really hurting me, and I felt I felt really betrayed. I felt like this, except I didn't feel like hugging him in return. <laughs> I just felt like I had the arrows in my back, and I was really hurt and I was really angry. There was another man there that I had spent a lot of time just walking through some difficult things in life with. I was cheering him on. I was encouraging him. I had been praying for him. I had done that for years, and he completely severed relationship with me and said, "You know, if if uh, you know, I, I I actually don't really want anything to do with you anymore. I don't trust you. I feel like I don't know you." And he just completely slammed the door uh, of relationship in my face. And I got completely cut off. And it was a very difficult time um, in our lives. It, we had no friends. We lost all of our friends. And so how do you deal with that? How do you go through something like that? Because the pain is real. But my heart before the Lord is, is something that's incredibly important for me to steward in a moment like this. And so I, I, I went to the Lord and I asked him for help. And, you know, I, I remember I, we had gone on a trip and I was driving down the road and I was thinking about my friend and I was thinking about how he had betrayed me and I was thinking about how he had hurt me. And I, I thought about, you know, just cutting him off of my life. He's like, man, you know, you're going to cut me off. Fine. I'm going to cut you off too, right? I'm going to cut you off too, man. And I, I was going to, I was going to walk away from that relationship. And I remember the Lord uh, speaking to me as I'm driving down this road. And he spoke to me out of Proverbs 17, 17, which says that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born for adversity. And the Lord said, I'm not giving you permission to walk away from this relationship. And I was like, wow, okay. It was a good humbling moment because our lives are not supposed to be our own. They've been bought at a price. We belong to God. It's about him leading us, not us deciding which way we're going to go and who we're going to cut off and who we're not going to cut off and who's going to be in my life and who's not going to be in my life. That actually is not our decision. That is the Lord's call to make because he is the king and he is my good father and he knows the end from the beginning and how all things are supposed to work out. You know, it's, 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 it's really interesting when you look at Jesus and his life and what he did the night he was betrayed. 
It's in John chapter 13. And in verse one to five, you'll see that Jesus washed Judas's feet the exact same night that he was betrayed by him. And he washed Judas's feet with the full knowledge that he was about to betray him within hours. Within hours, Judas is gonna betray him. And Jesus washes his feet. And then he says something in verse 14 to 15. He said, Jesus says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. That you should do as I have done for you. That includes Judas. <laughs> we don't like that. We don't like it because it's uncomfortable and it costs us something. Because you know what? Walking away from my friend would have been way easier, way easier. But I have my ear tuned into the Father and my life is not my own. And Jesus said he's left me an example to follow in his footsteps. Jesus says, follow me. And the things I do, you'll do. He's not just meaning signs, wonders, and miracles, although those are awesome. He's showing us a way of life. He's showing us a way to walk in relationship that is so countercultural that it can come across offensive when you first hear it, but it's the way that leads to life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I am following his example. He's left me. And the night Judas betrayed him, he washed his feet. And so now I'm bringing this understanding into my relationship that is going through a pretty hot fire. And I would like to get out of the fire because it's, it's getting pretty warm and I don't want a part of it anymore. But my father has spoken something and he has said, a friend loves at all times, a brother's born for adversity. I haven't given you the permission to leave this relationship. I want you to stick this thing through. And I said, okay, God, I need you to help me. And I was also having a, a, a real trouble with the other man that I had mentioned um, because I, I was just getting some text messages and it was just a really painful time. There was rejection on all sides, betrayal on all sides. And so I had to go to the Father every single day. I kid you not. I went to the Lord every single day and I said, Father, I forgive them for what they've done. I forgive them for what they've done. They haven't apologized. They haven't repented. But that has nothing to do with my responsibility to forgive. Nothing to do. Is it nice when people apologize? Is it nice when they see? Yes, it is. Of course it is. That's how we can have reconciliation in the relationship. But it is not necessary to have for me to forgive. Could you imagine if Jesus was that way with us? He said, while you were yet sinners, Christ came to die. God didn't wait for us to fall apart and, and fall into repentance. No, while we were yet sinners, he sent the son. And then he said, follow me and do likewise. So we need to also do that with others. So anyway, with my friend, uh, I, I started to ask God every day um, to help me forgive. Help me forgive, Lord, because I didn't feel like forgiving and I didn't feel like I had forgiven. So I, I stepped out and I started to forgive by faith. I wake up in the morning, I say, Father, I forgive this man for what he's done. I bless him. I bless his household. I bless his family. Father, I pray that you would draw him after you. I pray that you would cause him to know you like never before. I, I, I started to pray for him like I would want someone to pray for me. I wasn't praying, Father, I pray that you would rebuke him and that you would cause him to see what he's done and that he would fall on his face in repentance and ash and sackcloth and come to me in tears of repentance, Lord. <laughs> That's not what I did. I prayed for him like I would want someone to pray for me. I blessed him. Intercession began to rise out because I went to the Lord with it and I didn't just let it fester in my heart. I'm going to God with it the best way I knew how. And for me, that looked like getting up in the morning and saying, Father, today I choose to forgive him. I didn't feel like I forgave him. It wasn't about feelings. We walk by faith, not by how we feel, right? And so I, I, it, it was my declaration of faith that I believe I will forgive you. And I'm gonna start doing it every day. And sometimes friends, I kid you not, I had to do it more than once a day. By the afternoon, I'd get right worked up in my heart again as memories would come back and words that they had said or conversations that we had had. And I would get worked up again and be like, oh man, I'm just so angry. And then I remember say, oh yes. And I go to the Lord again and say, Father, I forgive them. And I release them from my heart to yours. And one of these times when I was praying this, 
the Lord uh, gave me a vision. I just saw this picture that was so clear. And one of the men that had betrayed me uh, was on my mind that day and I was quite frustrated with him and I was trying to forgive and having a hard time, but stepping out and believing for it anyway. And I saw this picture the Lord showed me as I was praying and there was this, this uh, image of like a statue. And uh, there was this blurred out face, this person was carving this image and I thought it was probably the Holy Spirit. And he's carving out this image and the image was a bit fuzzy at first, but then it, it kind of came into view. And I saw that the image was actually a statue of myself. And I had remembered that there was a message, I don't know if you've ever heard of Graham Cook, but Graham Cook had, had taught a message that was similar to this before, but I saw that Jesus was actually teaching me something in this moment that was personal to me. And the statue was a statue of myself. And it was like, I kid you not, like it was, it was a nice statue. The guy was doing good work. <laughs> it looked a lot better than I actually look. And uh, you know, it was just kind of like, wow, that's an impressive sculpture. Um, and I was, I was kind of intrigued by this picture that Jesus was showing me. And then all of a sudden, the man's face who had been blurry that I thought was the Holy Spirit came into view and it was actually the man who betrayed me. And he was molding this image. And the, in the silence that followed, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm using this man to mold you into the man that I want you to be. I'm using him to mold you into the man that I want you to be. And I was just like, wow. And I realized that as we go through these contentions and as we go through and work through offense and unforgiveness in the body of Christ and even with, you know, outside the body, there's things that God wants to mold in us that are going to come out the other side looking more like Christ than they did going into it. And that really encouraged me because I knew that I wasn't just suffering. I wasn't just going through betrayal. No, my father is the master potter and he's molding something in me through this painful experience. And there's actually life in that. And then you really do start to believe Romans 8, 28 that says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You know what probably would have not worked out very good for me? if I walked away from that relationship without the Father's permission. For those, the verse says, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Those are the things that all things work out together for good for. God called me to not walk away from this relationship. So in that promise, this is going to work out for good. It doesn't mean it won't be without pain. It doesn't mean it won't be without heartache. It doesn't mean it won't be without challenge and difficulty. But he will work it out together for good because he's called me to. That's really important to understand. And there's actually a lot of like excitement in that. You know, the Lord once said to me, he said, you know, if you really believed Romans 8, 28, you'd never complain again. <laughs> That's a side note. Maybe we'll get back to that one on another Sunday. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I, I went through this season and God just began to mold me and change me and to soften my heart. And I truly was able to forgive these men, truly. And I'm here standing today to say that years later, we are now closer. I'm now closer with those two men than I was back before that happened before any of that happened. I'm closer now than I was then because God caused it to work together for good. And we have a better relationship now because we've gone through some war together. You know, we have to remember that as we go through these things that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is the battleground. It's not where we, it's not the enemy itself. It's just the ground in which the enemy is fought, if that makes sense. So we're like the middle ground. We got heaven and we got hell and we're in the middle and we're the battlefield. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not. And we have to remember that, especially when so much of the war comes out through flesh and blood. That's the, that's the part where we, we just really need discernment and, and the help of the Holy Spirit to realize that we're, we're not fighting people, but there's people involved. And that's again why it's so important we keep our hearts clean and ask God to help us when it comes to uh, unforgiveness and offense, that we keep short accounts and we deal with it quickly. You know, one of the things on our practical side I've noticed is that a lot of times if we get, if we get offended with somebody, I want you to just think about yourself for a moment. When you get offended with somebody, what do you do? How do you handle that? How do you handle it? What do you do? 
what I've noticed, and I'm not saying you do this because I don't know, but I've noticed, and I have done this in the past before, if I'm offended with somebody and I got an issue with somebody, I'll go and talk to five friends about it instead of the actual person I have the issue with. That's often what will happen. That's often what we do. And in that, in the name of getting counsel, we often are tempted just to give in to gossip and slander. And we have to be really careful that we don't do that. It's really important that you don't just go to someone else who's going to agree with what's dysfunctional. You need to go to someone who has counsel, who's going to give you godly counsel, push you into Christ, Christ and move you towards reconciliation, who will have the same value on the person you have an issue with as they do with you. It's not about who's right, it's about what's right. And we have to fight for that in the body of Christ. We have to fight for unity, guys. We have to fight for, uh, for righteousness in our relationships and for what God cares about. And so in that, I, I just wanted to um, uh, just share a quick story with you that uh, I, I was quite, I was just kind of amazed at, by the Lord in, this, in what he did this day. But it was before COVID, I was going to a school, a high school, where I would go and just share with the kids uh, at, uh, lunch, at lunch hour every Tuesday. And it was amazing. God did a lot of really neat stuff. But the one day I was going there, I said, Lord, what do you want me to talk about today? And I felt like the Lord said, I want you to talk about forgiveness. I want you to talk about forgiveness. And I thought, well, okay, you know, it's like forgiveness. We all kind of know about forgiveness. And, and I said, but if that's what you want me to do, I'll, I'll, I'll trust you. And so I went there and I talked to all these kids about the power of forgiveness and how important it is for us to forgive. And I was kind of amazed as I'm watching, there was this one really big uh, uh, farm boy uh, that was, I think, in grade 11. And um, he, was, he was a big kid, tall, large guy. And he was like fascinated by what I was saying. And I was kind of, you know, uh, intrigued that he found what I was saying so interesting. <laughs> and uh, uh, because it was just, it was, in my mind, it was fairly simple. But after I finished speaking about forgiveness, he came up to me and said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, of course. And he just started to, he just burst into tears and started bawling. And he said, I planned on dropping out of high school today. I was going to drop out and I was going to join the army. And I realized as I was talking, as you were talking, that the only reason I was doing that was because I, ha I had a lot of pain in my heart and a lot of unforgiveness in my heart. And I realized that there's some people I seriously need to forgive and that I actually need to stay in school. And the, going to the army is not the answer. And, he's, and he just like is saying this as he's sobbing literally on my shoulder. A high school kid, farm boy, at the high school is sobbing on my shoulder telling me this. And I was just like, wow, the power of forgiveness, guys, is so incredible and it's so crucial in our lives and in our relationships. And I want to show you just from scripture how seriously Jesus takes us walking in forgiveness. How seriously he takes it. This is the verse that I want to read, I want to read to you. It's Matthew 6, verses 14 to 15. And Jesus says this, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Friends, we got to talk about this. This is the word of God. Those are red letters. That's Jesus speaking. He takes forgiveness so seriously that if you're not forgiving other people, then God will also not forgive you. That's really sobering to me. And we need to know that that's in there and he means it because it's the truth. Forgiveness for a believer is not an option. It's not an option. We have to forgive. Now, I know there's some really, really horrible stories out there. I'm not naive to the fact that there are horrendous things that people have been to and what a, what a person can do to another person is, I understand, I understand. So I'm not making light of that. I'm not saying that what we've, what we've gone through isn't real. But how we choose to respond to that is what is so crucial. And this is where we have to be very careful that we don't let sin against us produce sin in us. I'm going to say that again. Do not let sin against you produce sin in you. 
This is one of the issues we have to understand with the blood of Christ, that when Jesus shed his blood and had his body broken, not only did he deprive sin of its power that is in our own lives, but he also deprived sin of its power against us. It's not just the sins we commit, it's the sins committed against us. He's broken that power. And so this is so important for us to understand that, that we forgiveness is not an option. We have to walk into it. So yes, the stories are horrendous. I'm not making light of it, but the blood is so much more stronger. It's so much more powerful. The blood is amazing and it deprives what's been done to us from having any effect on us. It has that power. It has that potential if we'll step into what God has for us. And if we'll just, in all honesty and sincerity, bring our heart before the Lord and ask him to father us in these issues and let him in and be real with your pain, be real with your hurt, be real with what happened. Not about denying it, but being, but bringing that to God and saying, Father, would you help me forgive? Would you heal my heart? Would you remove the bitterness? Would you remove the offense? and help me to see that person for how you see them. Because the price tag on every single human being is the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they've done. That's their price tag. And that's your price tag. That is your value. The cross didn't just deal with our sin, it reveals our value. And that's so powerful to me. And we cannot forget it when we're hurt and offended as we go through life relationally. So God says, if we do not forgive, we also will not be forgiven. That's, that's a big deal. And we have to talk about it because it's the truth. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you the truth. And that's the truth. So that's how seriously the Lord takes us forgiving people. Because he went to an incredible extreme measure to have our sins forgiven. There's no one that cares more about forgiveness than Jesus. So when he says, I won't forgive you unless, we should take that very, very seriously because it's nothing but his heart to forgive. And so forgiving people is, is very important, but you might have to do what I had to do. When I went through that betrayal with my friend, I had to ask God to help me and I had to forgive every single day until that became my actual reality. I didn't feel like I forgave for a long time. It was months but I chose to forgive every day by faith. I said, I forgive you in Jesus' name and I bless you. And then God landed on that. And now I'm totally clean and clear. And like I said before, our relationship is stronger than it was before. That's the power of the gospel. So I'm gonna read one parable to you. It's Matthew 18 verses 15 to 31. And so I'm just going to read this parable to you guys. And I want you to think about this because Jesus is talking about forgiveness. Then Peter came to him being Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, and I just want to pause there. He's about to give us a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, and if you go and you look at the, uh, when Jesus gives a parable, when he starts off by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, he's often referring to a very specific aspect of the kingdom that you'll find in the context of what's surrounding the parable. And in this parable, it's about forgiveness. So he's saying that when it comes to forgiveness, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. In your footnote of a lot of your Bibles, you'll see that the 10,000 talents was a couple million dollars. And you'll later see there's a hundred denarii and that was, you know, a couple bucks. But that's not accurate actually at all. 10,000 talents, if you were to take it at minimum wage, is equivalent to 200,000 years of labor. 200,000 years of labor, 60 million work days, or $3.48 billion. That's how much 10,000 talents is. It's a big debt. When he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, but he was not able to pay. No kidding. His master commanded then that he be sold with his wife and children and all that they had and that payment could be made. 
And the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him of his debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii is about four months worth of wages. So in today's, uh, today's account, it's about $12,000. So at this rate, at, at getting uh, uh, four months, $12,000, it would take roughly 20 years to pay off one talent at this rate. It would take 20 years to pay one talent and you still got 9,999 to go. So he takes this, he, he takes this servant who owed him a hundred denarii and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that, he had, that this had been done, they were grieved and they came to their master and told him all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay what was due him. Verse 35, so my heavenly father will do to each of you if from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Wow, that is an intense parable. And the kingdom of heaven is like this when it comes to forgiveness. You know, it's amazing that you could be forgiven this debt of $3.48 billion and have that like freshly forgiven, like completely wiped away. And then you go and find someone who owes you 12,000 and start freaking out and grab him by the throat and threaten his life. It's, it's, it's hard for us to imagine someone actually doing that, but I want to say with as much compassion as I can, we are doing that today, my friends. We are doing that in our relationships. We have been forgiven for so much by an incredibly loving God. How much more then should we not be able to walk in forgiveness towards one another, no matter what they've done? No one has done $3.48 billion worth of damage to you, but we've done that to God. And how did he handle that? He went to the cross and took our payment. He went and took that. That's what he did and said, follow me and do likewise. And that's why it's so important that we forgive from our heart because God knows our hearts. It's not just about this Christian confession. Oh yeah, I forgave them. No, it's where we let God in and he moves by his Holy Spirit in our heart and we truly release them from our heart and we walk in 1 Corinthians love. 1 Corinthians 13, that love keeps no record of wrong. We say that scripture at, at weddings, at funerals, but do we walk in it? Have we become it? Do we really keep no record of wrong? It's a big deal. And I can tell you this, friends, that it is so freeing to walk in this kind of love. And this is something that God's been growing me personally in. You know, we often in our, even in Christian culture, we talk about these toxic relationships, toxic relationships. It's like, man, do you know how toxic we've been to God? <laughs> and how does he treat us? He's amazing. And so I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, being careful with boundaries and, and I'm like, that's a whole nother discussion. What I'm talking about is being free in your heart and having nothing against anyone, being absolutely free. You know, I went to a, a coffee shop a while back and uh, I was meeting a friend for coffee and we sat down and uh, we had been talking for about 10 minutes and then this homeless man came and sat beside me and he faced me and he just starts like interrupting and just starts talking about his life. And I turned and I faced him and I said, hey man, I said, what's your name? And he said his name and I shook his hand. I said, my name's Justin. I said, I'm in the middle of a conversation with my friend right now, so I'm not gonna talk to you. But when I'm done with my friend, if you'll be patient and wait, I'll come and sit down with you and we can have a conversation then. But until then, I'm gonna finish this one I'm having with my friend. I said, and I said, can you do that? And he said, yeah, I can do that. So he turned around and just faced the other way. And he waited for an hour. I had my conversation with my friend. 
my friend left and I went and I sat down and I, I said, hey, buddy, I said, what's what's going on? And he was an older fellow and he just began to share his whole life story about all the rejection he had been through, all the pain he'd been through. And I was literally looking at this homeless man, observing what unforgiveness and rejection had done to a life. And it was like, wow, it was it was pretty intense. And as I'm uh, listening to his story, the Lord began to teach me through a, through a picture I was seeing. I was just, in my mind's eye, I was just seeing this picture over this man's life. And I saw the father sitting as a potter. And he was, there was this, this room that the father was in <clears throat> as the potter. He's on the wheel. And then behind him was the shelf that was full of pottery. There was plates, there was cups, there was bowls all made by the father, all made by the potter. And he's sitting there working away and whistling away, just having a great time making this pottery. But in the picture, I saw that the pottery had the ability to speak and had the ability to talk to one another, the bowl to the plate, the plate to the cup. And the bowl looked at the, at the cup and the bowl said to the cup, you're terrible. I absolutely reject you. You don't look anything like you're supposed to. You're not as good as, you're not a bowl, you're a cup. You're a mistake. I reject you. And the cup kind of took this on or whatever. And it, it's, a, it's a funny picture, but God was speaking to me through it. And he just spoke this into my heart. And he said, if the potter has accepted all the pottery, then what is it if the pottery rejects another piece of pottery? In other words, it's Ephesians 1, 6. If we are accepted in the beloved, which we are, then what does it matter if man rejects us when the one who made both is the one who accepts us? The one who sees 100% clearly your value, my value, the other person's value. He sees 100% clarity. If he's the one who sees that and sees the end from the beginning and he's the one who accepts me, then what is it if man rejects me? Unless I choose to take on that rejection as an identity and cut off this one. That's when we get into hurt, pain, bitterness, offense, frustration, unforgiveness. That's when our hearts get in trouble. But if I can get my identity this way and know that I'm already accepted, it's impossible for you to reject me. Even if you tell me next week, Justin, we hated your preaching this Sunday. We don't think you're the best guy for this job. You're fired. Sorry, go find another church. You could say that to me. And you know what's crazy? I could 100% in my heart be all right because my identity comes from here and I already know I'm totally accepted by God. Is it nice to be accepted by people? Of course it is, but I don't need to be to be okay. That's the power of the gospel. And I saw this unfold, this understanding unfold as this homeless man was telling me his story. And so when he finished, I said, can I share something with you? And I shared what the Lord showed me and I shared the power of the gospel and the man wept. He broke into tears and wept because the power of the Holy Spirit was coming on him, showing him that he had spent a lot of his life under the power of something that he never should have given power to. And the road it took him down so unnecessarily. But what was also amazing is God also brought hope. And by the time I left, God had encountered him and it was a beautiful thing. And there were tears of joy versus just tears of sorrow. God brought incredible hope but he first had to bring an understanding of the power that the rejection unnecessarily had on the man because he took that on as his identity. And the father, the whole time, had you're an accepted beloved son of God. That's your true identity. And so how we walk these things out, my friends, is just, it's so important that we can be okay. Our hearts can be okay but it is so important that we walk in forgiveness. And if there's anyone, I, I just wanna encourage you, I'm gonna wrap up here. If there's anyone that you have issues with, if there's anyone that you have offense with, please go and seek them out and seek reconciliation. And also know that I understand that there's some people that you can't reconcile with. They are so not open to it. They don't care. They don't wanna hear anything you have to say. That door is shut. There's Reconciliation is not possible, but what is possible is your heart being absolutely free and, free and clear and good before the Father. And this is what I'm going to close with. Go and seek out people that you know that you, there, it's possible to have reconciliation. Ask the Lord to lead you in that. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. And 
keep this in the back of your mind and keep this on your heart. This is what I want to end with. This is why this is so important. The biggest reason, you know, I was, I was preparing for this message and the Lord spoke to me and he said, do you know what the biggest reason is that you should forgive one another? And the, the Lord got my attention and I said, what? He said, because you love me. <laughs> that should be your biggest reason. Don't, don't you love me? Don't we love Jesus? Do you know how much Jesus cares about this? Do you know that in, when he prayed his longest recorded prayer in John 17, there was a lot of stuff going on in there where he talked about, Father, would you make them one as we are one? Would you make them one like we are? Would you cause them to be one? So if that's the prayer of Jesus, and it's his prayer before he goes to the cross, don't you think the enemy's going to want to get in there and bring division and offense and, well, I'm hurt and, well, you said this and she said that and I can't believe they and they should have known better. Of course he's going to do that. But we got to come back to the reason we're here, which is we're gathering around Christ and what he paid for. And because I love him, I'm going to love this way. I so care about your heart, God. You know, so often we're, we want God to bless us. Well, what about our lives blessing God? What about our lives blessing God? Relationship is two-way. And sometimes in Christianity, we get a little bit selfish, even when it comes to forgiveness, because, well, I'll just feel better. Well, yeah, you will. But what about because we actually love the Lord in this as well? Love doesn't seek its own. I'm not going to forgive just because I'll feel better, although I will. I want to forgive because I actually care about relationship and I care about the heart of the Father who's observing all that's going on around us. He cares deeply for these things. Deeply for these things. And so I want to, I want to honor God and I want to bless God's heart by not making relationships something that's negotiable. I want to fight for relationship and I want us to fight for relationship. So I'm going to give you this permission. It might be funny as a pastor. You call me new, call me whatever you like. I don't know. Maybe it's a rookie move, but I mean it with all my heart. If there is ever something that happens in Jubilee Church and if I ever offend you or if I ever cross you in some way or you misunderstand something, I want you to approach me, please. I want you to call me. I want you to send me an email. I'm opening up my door to you. I want to walk in the light as he is in the light. So if you ever have an issue of any kind, please come to me. Let's talk about it. If you have issue with someone else, please come to me. We're going to talk about it and we're going to get the other person too so we can have true reconciliation and not just talk about it. I am wholeheartedly about seeing genuine, authentic, healthy relationship in the body of Christ. And if we can't do it here, we definitely won't do it out there. But if we can do it here, we can model something that the world is so going to be attracted to. So I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap up. But forgiveness is so important to the heart of the Father. And we must walk in it. It's not an option. And the Holy Spirit is here to empower us and help us to do it. Because quite frankly, without Him, we can't. But with Him, we so can. With Him, we so can. So Father, I just lift up everyone to you, Lord, in Jubilee and everyone listening. Father, I just pray that right now there'd be this moment of just genuine softness. I pray that Psalm 139 would be in the hearts of the people that says, Oh, Father, would you search me and know me? Would you try my anxieties and would you see if there be any wicked way within me? And would you lead me into the way of everlasting life? God, would you do that right now? Would you bring people to our remembrance right now that we're hurt by or have an offense with or harboring unforgiveness, Lord? Would you just bring that to our hearts and bring that to our minds, not in any way of condemnation, but in a way that we can bring this to light and truly forgive from our hearts like your word commands us to, that we would forgive from our heart and release those people and pr pray blessings over them no matter what. So I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would come into all the different rooms and houses right now and that you would break off trauma, that you would break off wounds, that you'd break off offense and hurt and bitterness and that you would cause good fruit to come up in its place, God, that you would cause healing and forgiveness to flow like rivers of living water. So God, I bless all the people who have heard this message and I just pray that you would come and encourage their hearts and cause them to walk in healthy relationships in ways that are absolutely pleasing to you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great week. Please feel free to reach out and I look forward to seeing you. Take care.